Okay, so to start, just a little bit about our office. Um, the mission of our office is to ensure Utahns can live a healthy and active lifestyle through outdoor recreation. Uh, one of the ways we do this, uh, one of the primary ways is through this Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant Program. Um, this began in 2015. Um, then it was it was just a little pilot program. It was so successful that by 2018, um, it became funded by the statewide transient room tax. This is the hotel tax. So we've really been seeing a significant growth in funds available for this. The UORG is for the construction of new outdoor recreation infrastructure. Um, eligible applicants include municipalities, counties, tribal governments, nonprofit organizations. Um, and it really funds just a large variety of projects that enhance recreation opportunities and amenities in Utah's communities. Uh, we really, really like to prioritize a diversity in, in types of projects that it funds. So no matter what kind of project you're thinking, there's a good chance as long as it's outdoor recreation, we'll find a way to get it funded. Um, and then because it is attached to that transient room tax, um, there is an emphasis on projects that are offering economic opportunities for the community, enhancing quality of life and providing social and health benefits. Uh, if we wanna just look at some real quick historic numbers. So all time, we have been able to give out $23.8 million um, since 2015. We're so proud of this number. Um, we really prioritize making sure that a lot of the funding does go to our rural community. So out of that, 66% has gone to our rural funding or rural county for funding. Uh, because there is that matching component, we've been able to leverage a lot of funding um, from other sources. So we have a seven to one private public leverage, supported 859 jobs. A uh, fun number is always the miles of trail. So we've been able to help fund over 550 miles of trail. And then we talked about the kind of the diverse outdoor recreation activity types. So far, we've been able to fund 32 different ones. Uh, just last year, uh, it was a little bit of a down year for tourism with the pandemic, but the legislature stepped up. They gave us an additional $4 million. So we were able to give out um, over $7 million last year. Um, just last year, we were able to support over 500 jobs. 70% went to rural communities. 23 counties uh, were able to get some funding. And as you can see, $14 million in requests. So with uh, about 7.5 given out last year, we were able to fund over half of all the dollar requests that we received. Uh, 20 different outdoor recreation types and 161 new miles of trail. So cool to see. And we're going to get to see a few project examples of, of where all this trail is coming from. And um, I'm Tara McGee, as uh, Patrick mentioned. I'm just going to go through uh, the various UORG programs. Uh, Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant. We do use acronyms, don't we? Uh, there is the, the main Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant. That is for the new infrastructure. So if you're building something that's uh, brand new that hasn't existed before, this is the grant type and we'll go through the various tiers. Also, the Recreation Restoration Infrastructure Grant. As we heard from many of you, there, there's real need to, uh, to do some restoration work, to do some really heavy maintenance work, and, and there's need for funding with that. So that's what this grant is for. And then uh, one of our new mini grants is the Outdoor Classroom Grant. And last year was the first year that we offered that. And then going into the various types or the various tiers of Utah Outdoor Recreation uh, grants for the new infrastructure, starting with a mini grant, um, it offers a streamlined application uh, for amounts that go up to and including $10,000. Um, it is for new infrastructure. It's got a one-to-one -one matching component, but uh, it, you will find that it's much easier to, um, to, to do the application. We were thinking that if you're not asking for a lot, you shouldn't be having to spend a lot of time on the computer going through the application. So we've, we've tried to make that as simple as possible. Uh, going down to the, the tier one, if uh, you have applied for our grant before, um, it used to go up to 150,000. It now goes up to 200,000. We realized that construction prices have gone up and this new amount may help uh, projects around the state with that. This again uh, is for new infrastructure uh, and there is that one-to-one -one match component. Uh, the, the, the thing that makes this different from the mini grant is it does have to show that there is some economic development or tourism benefit to the area by the construction of this project. Uh, what's shown there is um, 
a put in take out spot along the, the Jordan River. Um, and then the regional asset tier is up to a half a million dollars. Uh, for urban counties, only this, uh, it, there is some need to see this overmatched. So project value there must be at least 2 million. And this is for large new recreation infrastructure projects. Uh, it really needs to show a good economic and tourism tie. Uh, I will note that rural counties do not need to overmatch. One-to-one -one will be sufficient here. Um, and at the very end, there is a great opportunity, I would say, to present directly to the scoring committee on the day that they are doing meeting together to score these. That can be done online, um, as we're doing here. Um, if uh, COVID permits, we uh, can offer that to anybody that wants to come uh, make that presentation in person. Uh, it's, it's up to uh, your organization and you whether you'd like to do it that way. Uh, it is a requirement though, but it, it's really to your uh, benefit if you are asking for that much money because you can really explain your project better, help the scoring committee to really see it and as, as the benefit that it is to your region. So um, yeah, be, be thinking about that. We can answer more questions later. And uh, then eligible infrastructure, uh, this is, covered in the program guide, but these are the types of activities. And uh, we're, trying to, uh, we're trying to show that, uh, you know, this infrastructure can support all of these types of activities. Uh, on off-road motorized activities, adventure course, um, canyoneering, rappelling, water activities, natural surface trails, snow activities, and then adaptive outdoor recreation of all the types listed. So it tends to be fairly broad, um, but it is outdoor recreation as it's defined here. Um, that may not, that does not include things like basketball, uh, tennis courts, and that kind of thing. And so we looked at kind of some of the categories, but it's nice to actually take a look at some, some projects that have been funded and completed. Um, so starting at the top here, you know, very classic outdoor recreation. This is a mountain bike trail. This is up in Summit County uh, with the Mountain Trails Foundation. And one thing I like to point out about this is this project received funding from the Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant, but also received funding from the Recreational Trails Program. So they were able to utilize both of those funding sources to do this. Along with that, this is not just a one-off network. They're coming back every single year and adding to this network. So when you are considering these projects, you don't need to apply for everything all at once. You know, you could you could break it up into phases, into sizable chunks, uh, build one part of a network, then build another. So keep that in mind. Um, if you look on the right here, this is up in Vernal. It's just a wonderful community asset. This is uh, the community fishing ponds that they've done um, right near town. This is an opportunity for a lot of skill building. It brings the community together. Um, if you look at that gate that's on this, this was actually designed by a technical school there. So another way to like really uh, sell the application as, as com community buy-in um, to design, uh, probably get a cheaper price in fabrication and design. Uh, just a wonderful asset for the community. Um, down low, it's the equestrian trail. Working with uh, the San Rafael Backcountry Force is really inspiring because you know, it's a very dedicated group, uh, but a small group, and they're still able to utilize um, each other's resources, different funding sources, and have some pretty substantial projects. Um, here, they're able to do an equestrian trail. They're working on, uh, like, you know, uh, repairing culverts and bridges, trailheads. So really impressive to see uh, what smaller groups can even achieve with some of these funding sources. And then finally, this uh, boulder climbing feature, this is in Lions Park in Moab. This was one of the very first um, of the York projects. And you know, this is in an area with a ton of wonderful rock climbing, uh, but this gives the opportunity for a, a very safe and accessible skill building opportunity for kids to come out to this park, kind of develop a love for climbing. And then if they, you know, feel confident enough to actually go to real rock and try it out. Um, if not, they're able to come practice it in a safe spot. Uh, if we look at just a few of the other types of projects, so on the left, we have some of our mini grants, and then on the right, we have some of the regional asset here. So starting with the mini grants, uh, keep in mind, both of these projects were done with uh, grant awards of less than $10,000. Uh, this disc golf course was done by SUU. Uh, this is really just one of the more incredible disc golf course I've ever seen. Um, 
you know, when you think about building a disc golf course, uh, the infrastructure needed isn't so much. Um, when we think about costs and material, uh, they were able to put this together, you know, once again, for less than $10,000 in grant funding awards. Um, and then we have the Welcome Center Climbing Wall down in Castledale. If you've been to this area, you know, it's right near uh, just kind of the world-class legendary uh, Joe's Valley bouldering site. This is such a wonderful project that gives the community an opportunity to welcome climbers coming into town, um, you know, showing them like, hey, you are supported as you come here to enjoy like our world-class bouldering, but also gives the locals an opportunity to, you know, get on this little wall and then maybe get the confidence to like, let's go to Joe's and, and try some like larger boulder routes. So really great opportunity there. Um, up top, you can see this is the Logan River Blue Trail. This was a regional asset here, so a much larger award. They are creating this Logan River into a true water recreation asset. So they're putting uh, takeouts, put-ins up along it. Um, they have infrastructure for, you know, crossings, for restrooms, for parking. So really cool to see that. Um, and then finally, the East Zion Trails. This is with Zion Forever Project. You know, when we think about recreation, it's often, uh, you know, we, we want to say like, oh, you know, more, 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 but sometimes you need to actually kind of displace or, or dis disperse, excuse me, some, disperse some of the recreation. And that's what they've done here. We, we know Zion is one of the most popular national parks in the country uh, for good reason. It's really incredible, but just outside of Zion is also very incredible. And what they're able to do is build world-class mountain bike network trails. Um, and it's been able to kind of spread out some of that visitation. Um, it's a massive project, but this is really going to be one of the greatest uh, mountain bike networks um, that we have in the country. So really excited to see that. Um, and once again, those are the larger awards. These are true regional asset tiers. Yes. So one of the other aspects that we really would like to focus on with our uh, funding is making sure that uh, we've got infrastructure around the state that has provided access to everybody that can um, enjoy recreation. So one of the things that uh, we have got on our committee is we do have um, a representative for adaptive recreation uh, from the National Ability Center and then we do have somebody from the healthcare community who happens to be the director of the Spinal Rehabilitation Center in uh, Salt Lake City up at the University of Utah Research Park. Uh, both of those scores on this scoring committee are very um, focused on, is, are some of these infrastructure, do they offer access? And it's not as difficult as one might think to have your project be able to provide that kind of access, especially with uh, natural surface trails, because uh, adaptive recreation um, has come a long way, especially with these uh, bikes, as you can see here in this photo, um, there is real, um, bec because of these advances, um, these bikes can go a lot more places than they used to be able to. So uh, we've got E, um, electric assist that can get um, them up on slopes that they couldn't do so before because they were completely dependent on using their arms for that. Um, and uh, not all of them have uh, the strong arms to, to be able to do that, but now that's not going to matter as much. Um, also, they, they've become a little wider uh, less likely to tip. Um, advances are continuing to be made um, and we hope that some of the tipping is not going to be as much of a problem, but please um, just, just look for things like that you can do as um, for designing trails specifically, such as the wider trail turns, gates wide enough for adaptive equipment to even get through. A lot of times gates will have some kind of impediment to stop motorized recreation com from coming through, but um, oftentimes they won't allow some of these um, adaptive equipment to go come through, which are a mere 30 inches wide. Uh, so please uh, don't uh, create those kind of impediments if, if that can be helped and remove those and replace those gates. And that can be something done with an RRI or a uh, mini grant in the future if, if that's your desire. And then kiosk information at the appropriate height. Um, 
please contact us and we can get you in uh, touch with uh, those who have uh, more information on accessible infrastructure planning and uh, future documents will be coming out. Uh, we are aware of some that are being made right here in Utah and we're pretty, uh, pretty excited about that. So, and then park infrastructure is something else that um, we know those of you who are in communities where you're trying to do wonderful things with your park um, and you're feeling like, where, where can I get the money that I need to, uh, to be able to fund some of the projects that I need? Now, we um, do not have grant funding that's available for things such as pickleball courts or outdoor basketball courts or soccer fields. However, other things can be done and um, with your budget uh, that, that can make it possible for, um, for you to have um, park infrastructure that is paid for by your grant. One of those, if you can look on the left there, you can see like an adventure trail, which really provides the opportunity for uh, skill building with kids, with climbing and um, a lot of balance and mobility as they, they go through a simple trail around the park that has really been enhanced with some of these cool features. Um, and then on the right there, you're looking at on the top is the bouldering feature in Heber that was just finished this past spring slash summer. And uh, that was funded by our grant. Uh, that is another type of infrastructure that can be put into the park. Um, and then uh, that young lady do, holding her bow, uh, we have funded several archery ranges. One of those I know is going to be in a park in Kanab. And uh, please, please think about these things because uh, we are happy to help fund these. And then the other part that I might want to add is that uh, you know, one particular city had asked for funding for pickleball court and I had told, this was several years ago, I had mentioned that we didn't do that, but I noticed that very same year they put a trail through their park um, that really helped uh, with a long distance loop that was used by uh, and frequented by road bikers and uh, runners like myself and realized that they'd spent uh, several hundred thousand um, on that trail, including a bridge that could have been funded by our um, grant. Um, and they could have kind of shifted money around and that would have paid for a few pickleball courts. So uh, just please think about that. We're happy to, to work with you and to discuss what we can fund and um, just excited to, help your community to be able to get great infrastructure. Thank you, Tara. So, so far we've been talking about the Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant, which is funding for new infrastructure. But, you know, here, lucky us, live in the state of Utah, 75% of the state is public lands, which means there is a lot of stuff already in existence. Um, and maybe a lot of it does need heavy maintenance. So that is why we have the Recreation Restoration Infrastructure Grant. Uh, these funds alleviate the backlog of heavy maintenance on public lands within the state of Utah. And keep in mind, this is not just federal public lands. These are city, you know, state, county, um, however the land is um, managed. Uh, if it's public, you can use this grant for it. Um, and once again, this is for existing outdoor recreation infrastructure, and these projects should be in areas that are, are already developed, um, predominantly summer use, though there are winter, uh, but think of trails, campgrounds, day use areas, water recreation areas, um, and because it is on publicly owned lands, uh, you really need to make sure you're coordinating with the land management agency, um, you know, they just need to sign off, and there's a good chance if you go to, you know, say the BLM, they may have already have great ideas. They may be able to give you a lot of like tips, advice and support. So keep that in mind as you are considering this grant. If we look at the eligible infrastructure projects, you know, we went over some of them, but when we're talking about trails, these are motorized, these are non-motorized. These can be repairing bridges, culverts, uh, anything at the trailhead, parking lots. If you, you know, know of an area and it's, it needs some restoration at the trail, 
you know, consider this grant. Uh, same with campground picnic sites. Um, you know, the way we recreate now has changed, you know, as technology changes, uh, no longer is the infrastructure maybe, you know, able to adapt. Um, RVs are bigger. Uh, just, you know, these methods require sometimes just a reimagining of the site. So if you need to make uh, campsites bigger, you need to put, um, you know, electricity, you need to have better potable water sources, consider this grant. Um, same thing with water recreation. If you have a dilapidated boardwalk or marinas, you know, boats have gotten bigger. These are all opportunities. Um, and even with restoration on, you know, the banks um, or shorelines. And then we will always uh, really uh, put a plug in for any opportunity you have to create um, a more accessible outdoor recreation facility. We want to work with you on that. Um, it could just be small turns on a mountain bike trail. It could just be, you know, opening up things so all can use it. Um, and then keep in mind, when we do say we want things to be accessible, that does not mean easy. Um, we just want to create these assets so everybody has the opportunity to recreate with their friends and family alongside and together. Um, and as you are considering this grant, um, I worked on trail crews for many years. While I think, you know, it's a it's a great task to do seasonal maintenance and you know clean some drains. This grant is not for you know basic seasonal maintenance. This really is for major reconstruction or restoration. Um, as you are considering these projects, you know, once again here in the Wasatch, where I'm at, we have a lot of invasive weeds. Um, there are an, uh, environmental aspects that you should be considering when you're doing these, um, but they cannot be standalone. But as you're considering the restoration projects, um, if you do want to create uh, some type of system to mitigate invasive weeds that may have crept in, um, you can use that as a match. It just cannot be standalone. Uh, if we look at some of the examples of our, our funded RRI projects, um, this top one, this is uh, Red Canyon. This is the Red Canyon bike path. Um, if any of you have ever been to this canyon, this is really just one of the more impressive bike rides we have in the state. Uh, but when you're riding on this, this trail, you want to be looking up at all of the beautiful things. You don't want to be looking down um, and noticing cracks and like little gutters. Um, and that's kind of where it was at. But Garfield County was able to go through and completely repave, reseal this. And now you can just ride at peace and really enhance the, the visitation experience. Um, if we look over on the right, uh, this is a just a hiking trail. Um, pretty classic, you know, just a lot of retaining wall work, stair work. Uh, this is in tribal areas using tribal youth. So it's really awesome to see how you can kind of connect the, the local cultures, local communities into this work. Um, down below, uh, we're going to hear from Betsy from the Rivers Trails Conservation Assistance Program, they helped so much on this campsite renovation, they were able to kind of help connect this to, you know, the, the nearby trails and assets um, help restore a lot of this this campsite um, and then just to show you a little bit of kind of what winter could be uh, so these year grades with um, year upgrades um, this is up in the Uinas with the Bear River Outdoor Alliance they were able to create um, kind of accessible elements uh, with accessible ramps and bathrooms just to help give an opportunity for you know everybody to use this um, even in the winter months. So uh... We're, thank you, Patrick. We are um, excited to also um, focus on the Utah Outdoor Classroom Grant. Um, I just wanted to uh, note to everyone here that we have an entire segment focusing just on this alone that will be held next week on January 13th from 4 to 5 p.m. We have it later in the afternoon so that uh, K through 12 uh, school personnel can uh, be able to have that time of day to listen to this and to really um, learn about how this might uh, be an asset for their school or for their community. So uh, this is awards up to $10,000. This is a mini grant for community-based nonprofit organizations or public funded uh, schools, and this is to get kids outside and learning. Obviously, the kids here are just sitting on mere grass, um, but this is to gain skills in uh, especially uh, nature based STEM skills and to enjoy the outdoors. And as you can see, there is a link there that you might want to save if you're interested in joining us. We have some professionals that are going to be talking and discussing about some great examples. We do have a, a basic design guide and we will be coming out with uh, one that is a little um, uh, more involved uh, that we are working with the Utah State University on. Uh, they have uh, 
really great resources in there. So this is downloadable on our website. As you can see, business.utah.gov slash outdoor slash grant. So these are some kind of built environment. These can be amphitheaters. They can, these can be uh, you know, outdoor tables and chairs that are fixed along with a pergola or some other kind of shade structure. It can really be, you know, the needs are gonna be different based on whether you're talking elementary school or high school level. So uh, we really feel that uh, these aren't just for years where we're dealing with pandemic kind of issues, but these are really meant to get kids outside where they can really learn and uh, oftentimes just shifting uh, the focus from being inside to outside can really help kids pay attention and help that uh, help those lessons to be what we call sticky, to stay with them. And if you can think about the times that you spent in a field trip learning environment as a kid, uh, um, learning about science or history, how much those have stayed with you, I um, think you grasp a little bit of this, but uh, please join us for that. Um, and if you sign up for it and you cannot make it, just like this one, it will be recorded and able to be watched later. So if you're signed up for it, uh, you will be able to get the link given to you later, as well as the link to design guides and so forth. Oh, well, thank you, Tara. So we've gone over you know, our four grant programs that we're offering this year. So now we're gonna take a little pivot and get into the nitty gritty. Uh, so these grants are all matching grants um, and they're also reimbursement grants. Um, so what this means is that the grant, the reimbursement is given after the applicant spend. Um, and it is a 50-50 match or a one-to-one -one match. So one way I like to describe this is if it's a $10 project. The applicant will put in $5 and we will put in $5 for the total of 10. However, the applicant will put in 10 up front, and then we come in with our five. Um, these matches can be a combination of partner and applicant as well. So you're not expected to, of course, come up with the money all yourself. And we hope you do make great partnerships too create that match. Uh, the regional asset tier for our urban counties is a little different since uh, the project cost must be at least $2 million, um, so it is a bit of an overmatch there, uh, but for our rural communities, uh, they've, they've been given an exception and can just follow the one-to-one. -one. Um, and then finally, we do want all of our grant applicants to put some amount of cash into the into the match, some amount of cash into the match. Uh, we, we like to say show skin in the game um, for this, it's, it just shows that, you know, there is a true commitment. We want to make sure the applicant themselves are committed to this um, and they're going to be doing all the reporting. Um, and so as such, uh, this is kind of that dedication there. Um, we want to look at kind of allowed costs and matches. Um, I find it's most helpful to honestly start at the ineligible. So we use the system of the five P's for ineligible costs or matches. These are purchase of land, planning, prior work, permitting, and preservation, um, i.e. maintenance. So first thing, um, any work done before the contract is signed uh, is considered ineligible. Um, also, you know, we have um, administrative costs, photocopies, mileage, you know, these are also not eligible. Um, ongoing maintenance, uh, we expect to be done um, as that's, you know, that's kind of part of the creating the infrastructure is having a plan to keep care of it. Um, donations, while while it's great you got a donation, we cannot use that as a match. Um, we'll kind of go into this a little bit more, but there are so many opportunities throughout the application to show the full breadth of your project. Even if you have ineligible funds, they can really, really make your application stronger by showing a, you know, an even greater, greater commitment. Um, and then once again, we do have uh, limits to the match of the applicant's employees. Um, if they're already being paid for the work that's being done, we can't match it. However, if it's very specific to the project, we can use that as a cash match if you're being you know, paid through payroll or as in-kind if they're kind of volunteering off the clock. Um, looking at allowable costs, uh, really just necessary, reasonable costs that contribute directly to the completion of the work. Um, so when we say reasonable, we really want as much of this funding to go to the actual infrastructure as possible. Um, so this can be for you know labor skilled unskilled construction costs um, you know some of these are quite complex so we do want to make sure you have the opportunity to use some of your match uh, for engineering plans so that can be up to 15 percent as well uh, we are going to hear a little bit from rachel to talk about the rtp the recreational trails program but i like to just show 
how you can uh, really leverage these funds together to have quite a substantial project uh, while minimizing how much cash you actually need to come up with. Um, I use this example on our right. This is the Blacksmith Fort Canyon Trails. Um, this is up in Hiram City and uh, the Rivers Trails Conservation Assistance Program also helped on this too. So all of our presenters today have had some part in this, uh, but they, you can see, had uh, support from Cache County, from UDOT, from the UORG, from the RTP program, and a construction company. And they were able to make a really a beautiful, massive kind of paved uh, recreation trail network. Um, if we look at just a very quick example, so this project, Hiram City, it cost way more than $100,000. But for ease, uh, if we have a $100,000 project, cost and you were to get a grant award from the Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant for 40,000, you were able to get one from the RTP program for 40,000, you yourself could put in $10,000 in cash and $10,000 in kind and you would able you'd be able to create a, pro, a project for $100,000 where only 10,000 of it would actually be cash. Um, and also keep in mind in kind utilize volunteer base. Uh, Utah is number one in the entire nation in volunteerism. So keep that in mind. The communities here really do want to help and they do help. And the going hourly rate for a volunteer is $27.82, I believe. So those volunteers can really add up quick. Uh, you know, get some community days that build support. You get a lot of great labor that you're able to use as in kind. Um, and, you know, just connects everybody um, and, and has great finished projects as well. So um, I just wanted to go through the common mistakes. We'll call this uh, Grant Writing 101. Uh, we, we've seen through the years some of the mistakes that have uh, really hurt um, applications with either the scoring committee or just getting through in the first place. Uh, the first thing on there, uh, when we call it a stretch to make, call it an outdoor recreation project, Oftentimes we've got uh, folks that are trying to find funding for their pet project that really isn't necessarily uh, a infrastructure project even. Uh, like for example, I've, I've had one for, do you do training for our staff for being able to talk to tourists about how to um, you know, basically leave no trace principles. We think that's wonderful. We would fund signs for that, um, but we cannot uh, pay for something that is not infrastructure. Um, and then just applicant not putting in enough money at pet is uh, that that's kind of a thing where an applicant should at least be putting in uh, twenty percent, and that can be a combination of, of of the grant of the match for the grant. Uh, and that can be a combination of in-kind and cash, but it's, it's really important that the applicant not be uh, trying to bring in every partner and every grant available and not being putting in their own resources. We really wanna see that you're having skin in the game. Um, lacking detail. Uh, so there's an opportunity within the um, grant application to put down the abstract which is gonna be very brief, is your elevator pitch. It's, it's really short. That is the thing that is going to be shared uh, quite widely uh, with the, you know, and, and think of that as the one that's going to be seen by the legislature. So make it have, have just enough detail to differentiate it from any other, say it's a trail, from any other trail. Um, and you know why it's cool, but you're just gonna have like two or three sentences for that part. And then there's going to be a longer description. And at that point, you really need to describe this. Uh, that's going to be included in not just the contract, but that will be a little public facing as well. But it should have things such as if you are doing a trail, how wide is it? What's it? What's the surface? What's the mileage? Um, and so forth. And if it's a dock, uh, please describe, you know, is it going to have some accessibility aspects to it? Um, what's, what's, the, what's it composed of? What's the materials that it's going to be used? Um, and, and so forth. Um, you know, what kinds of, uh, is it going to be just, you know, in the case of a dock, is it just going to be, uh, you know, for swimmers and stand up paddle boards or is it gonna be used for motorized boats? 
uh, for temporary uh, moorage and that kind of thing. Um, you know, and then the want, not a need is, is more about those issues where you've got some uh, one in, you know, just an individual or two's pet project. And we consider that a want maybe specifically just by a few people, whereas any of the infrastructure um, that you might be talking about that the um, community is really behind, we will call that a need. So uh, it really needs to show that, that um, you know, for example, if, if, if you've got a mountain biking, high school mountain biking team that is going elsewhere and really uh, utilizing the trails in another community um, and really need their own, that is a need in your community. Um, for the, the UORG uh, tier one, that's up to 200,000 and the regional asset tier, uh, the bigger the ASP, the more the connection to tourism you should probably show because it does come from the transient room tax. Uh, but I would say also economic development aspects of it, especially with the UORG tier one are perfectly acceptable. Um, and by the way, glad you're asking these questions. We'll get to some of them later. And then difficult to tell whose project it is. This is this is more of an aspect when we've got um, a uh, situation where we've got somebody applying that's really not eligible. Uh, for example, the worst case scenario might be a private company that really wants a trail through their private area. Um, and the applicant is uh, so, you know, an eligible one but um, trying to make sure that it is, it is really the applicant's project and, and driven by them is going to be really helpful um, for you. And if you've got um, real questions about that, please contact us because some of those issues can be really tricky. Applying to the uh, wrong grant, um, for the most part, if you're doing something completely new, uh, that would be for the Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant and RI is for restoration. But as noted, um, and I don't know if I finished writing it in the chat, um, if, for example, you were doing the shooting range and we don't have, it doesn't seem like it fits neatly into one of the categories of the RI grant. And maybe what, what I'm saying is it is kind of a restoration of the existing shooting range. Um, but you, uh, and there may be some really great new features, it'd probably be best if it's not going to fit neatly within those categories of the RRI if you've applied to the UORC. But um, the RRI is a streamlined application. Um, and so the temptation for those that are applying at the last uh, hour or two of the last day that you can apply is to try to go through the shortest one possible when, um, that can be a real detriment because uh, you might make yourself ineligible by applying uh, for the wrong one. So um, then uh, the other things that I just wanted to, to focus on is, you know, this, this part, you know, where we talk about how, how your project is actually meeting a need, you know, the want, it's solving a problem. So you're saying we don't have X and we need this. And this is why it's really going to meet a need um, really going to be desired in our community. Uh, and then please get to know your local tourism directors, especially if you're saying that this is a tourism of a project that's going to appeal to both residents because residents often love even more than the tourists, the same things that you, that you might be saying, hey, the tourists are gonna come here, they're gonna stay in local hotels and buy food from local restaurants and really, uh, provide an economic boost to our area. Um, so please get the tourism uh, director on board. They're often able to market it afterwards. And uh, we, uh, and it is required that you have uh, some kind of letter of support from either your tourism director or your economic development director. Sometimes in some counties, those are one and the same. And then if you're going to be, if your project's going to host any kind of events, uh, for example, we've got a project that we are really proud of being part of with an equestrian area down in um, the Mount Pleasant area. That is something that if you focus on that within your application, it's really going to help you uh, with the scoring committee um, and demonstrate how that fits in. And then partners, we love to see various partners 
uh, coming together to support a project in various ways, whether that's the BLM with, with staff and or money to help with a, a trail project, or it's a uh, local, uh, in the case of the construction shop, actually giving deep discounts uh, for materials or um, another one where you've got a trail group that's coming out and doing a lot of the volunteer work on the project. Um, and then we do provide that program guide. It's got some great guidelines. It's going to help you keep within the criteria. So please read and follow that. And then please, we're going to say this a few times, we are here to be your resource. We don't actually score these. We will go through it and help you look at it for eligibility. We're here to be your advocates. We're not, um, because of that, it's, you know, think of us like your, your kind of your tutor that you might've had in high school or college. We are here to help you to make sure you get the best application out there. We want to see those applications to shine and for the best um, projects to really rise to the top. So, and then lastly, um, some of these things are gonna be really hard to, uh, so please proofread, give us the correct organization, primary and secondary contact info. Um, it's, it's really important too that we, especially if you've got a professional grant writer uh, that is writing this information, um, it would be better if they put their name down under the secondary contact, but either way, it's, it's really important that we have both the primary and secondary contact. Um, sometimes that first primary contact does not stay. We've had some, we had a really pretty good um, application several years ago that was done by a summer intern, or I should say seasonal intern. They, that intern was gone by the time uh, the grant was awarded and um, we're trying to get a hold of them. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a little hard when, when that person has moved on. But um, anyway, spend time really crafting that project abstract and project description, share that with others in your organization or friends and um, have them give you some great feedback. Please start early right now. Um, start gathering those letters of support and the documents and letters you will need as you go through that um, within the application. Uh, Patrick's going to be focusing on the different types of documents and letters you will need. And then uh, please uh, try to know that, you know, word for word, the scoring committee, the statewide reporting is going to be used. Um, and I will say too on this, please, um, when you're coming up with a name for a trail when you haven't named it yet, try to at least be somewhat descriptive. There are so many trails in this area. Um, you could, can't put something down like just Sevier County Trail and have us expect to know what trail that might be. So um, please uh, be, be a little more descriptive and then uh, just try to make sure that you don't have um, <laughs> all caps on or anything like that. So, so please, um, please check that. And then uh, use the right descriptive adjectives and watch your words. So Patrick focused on the different grants and different grant applications and different <laughs> entities might be focusing on things that they like. If you are applying for a Utah Department of Transportation fund, and you want a paved trail and you're coming to them for the same trail that you're coming to us for, please use the word active transportation. They love that word. It means a lot to them. And when you're coming to us and you're asking for funding for that same trail, please focus on its recreational aspects. You just have to know to whom you're talking and don't just copy and paste from one uh, application to the other. And then, uh, you know, sidewalks, again, that's something we don't fund at all. We do fund, um, we do fund tr great paved trails though. Um, and stroller lane, uh, that was the unfortunate uh, description from a few years back that the, that almost uh, was the downfall of a perfectly good grant application because uh, the scores just did not feel that was a great 
recreational trail just by the description that have been used for that. And frankly, a paved trail can be used by strollers, can be used by people with dogs, people with, with the bikes and so forth. So please try to think broader, um, especially if you're doing those kind. And then on unique letters of support, please don't um, have uh, provide the same letter of support written word for word to each of your supporters to send back. Just give them some general things maybe to focus on, something that might be important to them so that the letters are coming back with letters of support and they look unique. Uh, they're not just different um, letterhead with the same letter. And that well, should really help. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and be sure, yeah, to use those tips. So thank you, Tara. Um, now, you know, we've kind of gone through a lot, but um, now it's nice to actually look at what the application itself is. So the application uh, has contact information, our project summary, project readiness and scheduling, economic impact, our recreation access and value, and required supportive materials and attachments. Um, you know, like Tara mentioned on the summary, you know, really focus it on the summary. Um, throughout this entire application, you will have so many opportunities to really enrich the story with other components. So stick to what the project actually is on those. Um, for project readiness and scheduling, we expect these to be somewhat shovel ready. Um, you know, we don't wanna see that there's a ton of planning that needs to be done. Uh, so we wanna see that, you know, there is the plan. Scheduling, you know, we will have a timeline. Uh, we're not expecting a week by week breakdown of what's gonna happen, but this is six months by six months. Um, it's, it's a pretty modest schedule. We just want to see that there is a plan. The economic impact, um, as we consider economic impact, it doesn't just have to be like more people staying in hotels. You know, a, a healthy community using paved trails is saving money on medical costs. You know, there's a lot of ways to measure economic impact. So don't think it just has to be purely like cash transactions, uh, recreation access and value. You know, you're a member of a community, you know the needs. Um, if there is not enough access to an area, if there's too much access to an area and you need to actually like, uh, you know, distribute some of that visitation. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to consider this um, and you as a community member will know those the most. Um, and then let's jump to our required supportive materials and attachments. So we have our location map. Um, obviously we wanna know where it is. Um, if you just put a star in the state of Utah, that's not gonna be enough. Uh, we definitely know it's in Utah. Um, so just kind of, you know, give us a general area um, and then also, you know, your project site. W-9 form, this is how we verify you're el eligible and this is also how we pay you. So make sure you are giving us a W-9 form. The applicant logo, we say this a lot, but our applicants, our, our grant recipients make us look really good and we like to promote that work. Uh, the best way we can do this is if we have your logo. Uh, the recreation site plan, engineering plans, or conceptual drawing, uh, depending on the project, uh, this will differ. If you're building a very complex marina system, we probably want to see some pretty developed engineered plans. If you're just doing a trail reroute for a recreation restoration infrastructure grant or a new trail, it doesn't need to be as much, um, but we just want to see that there is a plan and that the, the plans drawn up are appropriate to the project. Uh, your letter of support from tourism or economic development office. You know, once again, this is just our UR tier one and regional asset tier, but reach out. Our tourism directors, our economic development officers in the state are incredible. They're going to be helpful. They're going to connect you to partners. They may have already had ideas and they're very much going to support and they're going to help you. Uh, so do reach out to them. Statement of responsibility, you know, once the infrastructure is built, who's gonna take care of it? We just need to see that there is a plan. Generally, this is gonna be whoever's managing that land. Uh, sometimes it's volunteer groups, but we just don't want these to be built. And then two years later, have you come back to apply for a restoration grant? You know, we wanna see a long-term maintenance plan. Budget spreadsheet, uh, you know, this is generally where a lot of people get hung up. Um, please reach out to Tara and I, we will help you. Uh, we're gonna be releasing some how-tos on the budget, but we just wanna see how the money's being spent, um, make sure everything's eligible. And then written confirmation of donations from financial partners. If you are receiving a sizable donation, whether it be financial or if it's you know non-financial, if it's materials, we just want to make sure that the person who's donating it is actually committed. And this is another opportunity to really enrich your story. Um, allow them the opportunity to write you know a small letter showing their support. Um, our scores will read these, and they will you know really consider all the support it's getting. And if they're able to actually write like an eloquent. Uh, letter to support it, that's going to bode really well for your application strength. Um, timeline, like I mentioned before, this is not a week to week. It's just six months by six months. We just need to see the time. Um, the MOU or landowner agreement, 
whoever is managing the land, they just need to be on board. So you need to have the agreement. Um, this could also be an opportunity for a you know private land holder who's given an easement to once again write in support. Um, it's you know enriching your story. Um, and then federal permits or a letter stating their status. While these grants do not require a completed NEPA, uh, we do need to see that there has been you know some progress if it's on federal land. Um, it doesn't have to be completely signed off, but we will need to see a letter from you know a district ranger just saying like, yep, we're on the way. We're where you know this is going to this is going to progress positively. Um, all of these templates are available on our on our website uh, for the budget spreadsheet timeline and the statement of responsibility, and they're also available on the application portal. Uh, when you do start applying, we really want you to be able to do as much of the work outside of the portal as possible. Um, you know, whether whether you get stressed in the portal or not, uh, it's probably a little nicer if you can just kind of do it at your own pace. Um, you know, in a word processor. Um, or even in your car, as you're, or even outside, hopefully. Um, but to prep for this, you can actually go visit our grants website, um, and you can see the link down at the bottom, and you can actually download a PDF of the entire application. You can see the help text, you can see the questions, the word count. It's really, really helpful um, and get all of those attachment templates. So you will know everything. You will not be surprised by a single word on the application once you get in. Uh, feel free to work in a word processor, You know, use those grammar and spell checks. Um, you always have a hard copy uh, because you know if you are in the portal, we do want you to save your work frequently, um, connection errors or server issues. We just don't want you to lose anything. So one way you can prevent that is by working out of the portal. Um, and then when you are using the, the templates, if you're downloading them inside of the portal, just make sure you actually download them, then complete them, and then re-upload them. Um, every single year, we see people who click on them. They're viewing them in their browser, but it's not actually downloading, but they'll complete them. And, you know, it, it seems like they've submitted something that is full of text, but when we get it on our end, it is, it is blank. So just keep that in mind. Um, then you can see our application period opens on January 18th. Uh, on that day, we'll put the link right on our website um, at that link, um, and you can go ahead and hop in. Yes, yeah, so uh, just to uh, do review the important dates uh, coming right up, the grant period of where the application will actually open will be Tuesday, January 18th. It will be at 9 a.m. Um, it will close on uh, two months later in March at 5, 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Uh, just wanted to focus though in between that we are offering uh, this early deadline of the end of February. So if you submit your application before this date, you can get a staff review before the grant period closes. And just to reiterate, what that means is you keep your application in drafts so you can still edit it, but then you email Patrick and or me um, and one of us will review it and uh, be able to uh, give you some idea if, if it's looking good, if some improvements need to be made, and then you can go back to your application and make those uh, changes and improvements. Um, and it's, it's just something very simple. Uh, we're not gonna rewrite it for you, but we can definitely make some, um, some suggestions for improvements if that is needed, or we can tell you, hey, it's good to go. You can you can finalize it. Um, there have been those folks who have sent us a perfectly good uh, grant application at that point, and there's been nothing. We've just said it is looking awesome. Um, so the way we have this set up, um, we have uh, the, the scoring committee will be uh, getting these applications um, by early April. Patrick and I will merely do a staff review to make sure things are eligible in March and uh, make sure they're and prepare those to go out to the scoring committee. Um, and then uh, they will meet together at the end of April for a two day uh, scoring committee uh, meetings. And uh, these are people that are, you know, giving up two days of their lives to go through these, these projects and these uh, applications. So that, you will know if you are applying for an RTP grant to match uh, and using our grant as a match for that, uh, you can tell them. So the date that the RTP um, opens is May 1st. And um, if you are applying for uh, both of those and you want to, uh, to know that, please uh, 
let us know and we can make a note to let you know by uh, that Friday before uh, March 1st, uh, May 1st, sorry, that you are in fact getting it. Um, the other reason that people might wanna know early is if they'd like to start work as soon as possible um, and they uh, can, uh, we can also let you know and you, we can have the contract backdated to the day that the award was actually in fact awarded. Uh, that would be like say April 28th or something like that. So um, please, yeah, just start early, reach out for support, know that we're, we're here to help support you in any way. And, um, and then just a review of the resources that we have. Uh, it's just, I uh, mean, I know some people have asked, you didn't quite get that. It's just business.utah.gov slash outdoors slash grants. We will be sending everybody here on this uh, kind of a, some, some links here uh, to this in a few days, but you can go online right now and get this. You've got the, the 22 uh, guide and then the, application sample. So, uh, and then you've got my email and Patrick's email right there. Um, you can reach out to both of us and we're happy to answer your questions. Although I will say I am in Philadelphia right now and, and uh, visiting my new granddaughter, our first. And so I will be out for a few days, but um, I will be back and completely here during the application time. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tara. And, you know, I always just like to really stress um, your best resource may be Tara and myself. We take so much joy in, in helping our community members um, access these funds. It, it's really inspiring to see you all are doing the hard work on the ground, and we are very committed to doing everything we can to, you know, help you plan, help you write. Uh, so please take advantage of us. Um, just some final things that we want to touch on as you are considering, you know, the next phases in your projects. We love to plug Utah Core Collaborative. Uh, this uh, partnership leverages state, federal, and private funding. Uh, they are employing youth, uh, teaching them leadership skills, uh, kind of really preparing them for the next phase in their life. Um, and on top of that, they do phenomenal work. Every single applicant that we've talked to that has employed some of these groups just has nothing but amazing things to say about the character of the individuals and the quality of the work and how easy it is to work with them. So you can see a few of them here, the Canyon Country Youth Corps, SUU's IIC, and Utah State's uh, UCC. So feel free to reach out to them if you do have, you know, kind of a construction project. Um, they are wonderful resources. And then finally, uh, the Utah Trails Forum has, is something that we've been developing. We just uh, finished the summer having our first annual conferences, uh, but essentially this is just a statewide um, information sharing network. Uh, we really have strove, striven to have, uh, you know, just a network where we're bringing in industry professionals, advocates, volunteers, community leaders, um, just to advance building and care of natural surface trails. Uh, we want somebody in the region next to you to have an issue and one that you have already dealt with connect you to give that insight um, if you're looking to mentor if you're looking to be a mentee please contact us uh, this is really a wonderful learning resource um, you know we everybody here who uses trails whether professionally or just because they like um, you are part of the utah trails forum and we definitely want to connect you all um, the link is down there at the bottom um, you know stay tuned for more kind of educational uh, webinars um, and opportunities for network and knowledge sharing. Um, so with that, um, I've, I've been very happy to see you all put comments um, in or questions into the comment box. Uh, we want to have a formal Q&A um, here probably at the end. Um, so please uh, keep putting your questions into the comment box. Um, Tara and I can go ahead and get those answered. Um, if you have something a little more complicated, uh, we'll open it up towards the end. So with that, I want to go ahead and pivot and introduce our next presenter. Um, this is Rachel Toker, and she's with the Division of Recreation, is going to be talking at first about the state OHB grant, uh, the fiscal incentive grant. So with that, Rachel, please take it away. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so today I'll be talking about the fiscal incentive grant, and then I'll also be talking about the recreational trails program grant also known as RTP, and this grant is known as FIG. Okay, 
So this grant is a quarterly grant. We are actually, actually right now currently receiving applications for early review for this. Uh, this is a state OHV grant. So the funding for this grant is solely related to OHVs um, or off-highway vehicles. Um, and this bill was passed in 2018 in the general session. What it did is it took the funding that was being received county to county uh, for those people that were registering the machines. And there was a slight uptick in registration fees. And now that registration cost increase is going into a fund where we pull from and allow for grants. Um, and the reason why we had this bill passed to begin with is that the majority of users, OHV users, are across the Wasatch Front. So the funding was going across the Wasatch Fund, the front. Um, in the state of Utah, um, in Salt Lake County in particular, there are four miles of OHV trail. Um, so that's where most of the funding was going. And now this is being dispersed throughout the state as a whole. So for this grant, funding can go for federal agencies, state agencies, political subdivisions of the state. So what that means is counties, cities, sheriff offices, et cetera, and then nonprofit OHV user groups. So right now we have $3.5 million available annually. Again, this is quarterly. Um, and just to briefly talk about the approval odds for this are as high as 85%. Each quarter, we are beginning to see more and more applications as word spreads about it. Um, so that may slightly decrease in the future, but as it stands right now, we do have great approval odds. And another great feature with this grant is that you can receive 75% of the funding upfront. So once a contract is in place, you can request that funding upfront and get your project started. So this is intended more so for shovel ready projects, but we do have a two year timeline for these grants. So it doesn't have to start immediately. Um, because it is quarterly, I tell people that if it doesn't work out the first time, you can always apply again next quarter. And again, with it being quarterly, we try to have a really quick turnaround time. So from the date that your application is closed, and all the way to review and awarded is generally about four to six weeks. So if you're looking for additional funding for the OHV side of your project or an item that you have that you wanna get done that includes either like trail work or tourism, et cetera, um, on the sidebar, you can kind of see these are the different categories. As you can tell, there is an others category. So it's very flexible um, with what it can fund. Um, to give you an idea of some of the items that we funded, um, for, oh, sorry, Patrick, will you go back one? Thank you. Um, to give you an idea and so the projects that we have funded for search and rescue, to give you an example, we generally fund radio systems for them. Um, we funded UTV purchases, motorcycles, all intended for OHV rescues. Um, and that's a good example because that machinery may not be used completely for OHVs. Um, it may be for multi-use recreation. So this grant will pay for the motorized side of things. So if you have a multi-use trail, you can get funding for this grant for the motorized side of things. Um, and just a little brief overview or just a little um, tidbit about it. Currently, it does not fund snowmobile related projects. That is because the funding that was increased through OHV registration dollars did not increase snowmobile registration dollars. So that may be changing in the future, but as it stands currently, this funding, this grant is only for OHVs, not the winter side of OHV usage. Okay, so what's great about this grant is that right now there's $3.5 million available annually, and we don't have a limit on how much you can request. Um, projects do tend to range from anywhere to about 20 to about $120,000, but we've seen projects as low as $5,000 and as high as $220,000. Um, earlier today, I was speaking with Tara and Patrick and we were discussing the High Desert Trail, which is a trail system throughout multiple counties. And all those counties are beginning to apply for this grant for funding. And each entity is generally applying for about $120,000, but as a whole, 
at the end of it all said and done, we will be paying around a million dollars, potentially um, funding about a million dollars towards that trail system. So it does have a lot of availability with it. Um, and also connecting with other counties and partners along the way are very important as well. With this grant, and it's something that is new, so if you've applied in the past, um, this is a new thing, is that we are requiring a 25% match. Um, what I've been seeing recently is that people are applying and they're taking, they're not using the whole 25% of the project total, they're just taking 25% from the amount that they're requesting. Their total project cost, the 25% should come from the total project cost. So keep that in mind. Um, with this grant, it can be include cash and in kind. Um, it can include all cash, all in kind, or a mix of the both. Um, it can also be matched with other federal grants like RTP, which I will be discussing later on, as well as state grants. So the grants that Tara and Patrick discussed earlier. Okay, so just a quick rundown for this. Um, again, this is quarterly. So the fiscal incentive grant is open for 45 days. We currently have one open. It opened December 1st and it will close on January 15th at 5 p.m. That is a Saturday. I will be working, unfortunately. Um, but with that, um, what I have users do or applicants do is they can send in their grants for early submission and review. So recently, so far, I've received about 12 already, and we still have a good nine days before the closing date. And that's just early reviews. Um, as Patrick and Tara had to say, I will not write your application for you, but I will go through and make recommendations or suggestions um, to help with clarifying things, making sure that it reads, um, that you can look at a budget and understand what the project entails, et cetera. Um, so with that, every quarter on the 15th at 5 p.m. is the closing date. And from there, applications are reviewed and are and recommended by our OHV Advisory Council. Our OHV Advisory Council is on a recommendation base, so they only recommend the applications. Um, and then it goes to the final approval board, and that generally takes place um, within four weeks after the closing date. Um, and at the latest six weeks. And then from there, I try to get notifications out if possible the same day, but I tell people one to two business days after they've been approved. So with this grant, it has a lot of opportunities for it and the funding capability as well as the turnaround for funding. Okay. So next I will be discussing the annual recreational trails program. I'll probably be referring to it as RTP. This is a federal grant. So with this, it was authorized in Congress in 1991 as part of the Surface Transportation Efficiency Act. So this, we are a pass-through agency for this. Every state across the US has the ability to take on this grant if they want to. Um, so with that, the funding does come from the sales tax that you see on your gas. So the funding that we receive for this grant does fluctuate year to year. Um, and that is just because it, again, it is based off of that sales tax. Um, so in the recreation based sales tax as well. <laughs> okay. So in the state of Utah from 1993 to present, um, RTP has funded $33 million and that's about a total of 681 projects. And the matching fund is about $64 million. So as a whole, that's almost $100 million going back into trails throughout the, the state of Utah. This is for motorized and non-motorized. Um, that $33 million that you're seeing, half of it went to motorized, half of it went to non-motorized. So with this grant, as I stated, it is for motorized and non-motorized, but the funding that we receive is split equally for the between the two. Um, this grant does require a 50-50 sponsor match. Um, so we will fund part of it and then the other end of it should be composed of either in-kind cash match or combination with other state grants or other partners. And that does include donations. Um, with this grant though, we do 
it is a reimbursable grant. So once the grant is complete, that is when you would receive the funding for it. And this grant is also has a two year timeline. We are following um, the federal, their year end date. So it is a little bit different. What's nice about this grant is that the closing date for this application is right around the time that OOR is announcing their funding for those grants that have been approved. So what's great is that we're usually in tune with that and we work together to make sure that if a grant is relying on both of our funding, we will know if the grant has been approved from OOR and whether or not it will be passing on our end. So if you will be able to complete your portion of the matching fund. So with this, as I kind of discussed, is that 50-50 match. Um, listed below are some of the items that are a valid um, match for these. Um, and then also some requirements that we have. As I stated, it can be a combination of in-kind cash or the two. Um, so some of the valid, sorry, some of the valid matches listed below are volunteer or staff labor, staff labor, value of land easement or donations, value of equipment donated, rented, or used, and value of donated materials for supported project construction. It cannot be composed of just in-kind match, match. We do require that it is mostly a cash match or a combination of the two. So with this, because it is a federal grant, we do require NEPA. And NEPA must be completed prior to the project beginning. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and again, it's a federal grant. So NEPA has to take place for all grants that include trail work. Um, another thing that we have to follow is the Buy American Certificate. So that just includes iron or steel. It needs to be made in America, um, but we will fund $2,500 worth of it. So if you're trying to purchase, let's say, grooming equipment or a snowmobile through this grant, we will fund $2,500 of it unless it has the Buy American Certificate included with the grant. Um, so keep that in mind if you're trying to purchase large machinery. Um, this also is for renting. Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so listed below are some just of our eligible projects and items. Um, I won't go through all of these, but I will kind of just discuss an overview of it. Um, this is recreational trails, so it is for trails. Um, so it does, we will not be able to fund added amenities. Um, we will fund restrooms, but let's say you're trying to purchase sprinkler heads or landscaping um, or water fountains, those kind of things. Um, or it is technically not a trail. It falls more so under being a road. Um, we are unable to fund that, but thankfully we work closely with the Office of Outdoor Recreation and some items we are unable to fund, but they can fund. So please keep that in mind. Um, this also, um, it does allow for the purchase of land. Um, to give you an example, and I think they'll be talking about it a little bit later on, is the G Hill. Um, we also helped on for the non-motorized side of it, and I believe actually the motorized side of it helped purchase that land from Sitla. Um, so just an just something to keep in mind is that when you're applying for this grant, if it is a multi-use project and it's motorized and non-motorized, we can receive applications for the motorized side of it, and then a similar application, but slightly altered for the non-motorized side of it. And with this, because it does come from um, fuel tax, again, that uh, funding availability does fluctuate. Um, we require that applicants request no more than $100,000 per application. Again, they can have multiple applications, um, but they have to be for different projects unless you are applying for the motorized and then the non-motorized side of that app for that project. Um, right now, our funding available is about $1.4 to $1.7 million annually. That does tend to change because we do also include rolling funds. So to give you an idea, I believe last year, the motorized side received $1.1 million of funding and then the non-motorized also received $1.1 million of funding. So there is more availability with funding. Um, we just gave a lower number because again, it does fluctuate. It does It is based off of 
those rolling figures that we have from past applications. And again, just another overview from submission all the way to the award phase. Um, application period, it opens February 15th and it closes May 1st at 5 p.m. annually. Something, and it's in my opinion, it may be the only good thing with COVID um, is that now grants can be submitted electronically. Prior to this year, or sorry, prior to COVID, um, we required all submissions to be either hand delivered or in the mail by 5 p.m. on May 1st. Um, and with that, it also did not allow for digital signatures. That thankfully has since changed and will alleviate a lot of stress coming May 1st. Um, but with this grant as well, we do allow for the early review period. I will now be managing this grant. So, and I have not decided on a date for that early review. Um, but it will likely be two weeks before May 1st. So keep that in mind. If you have an application idea or you aren't sure how you're going to kind of finagle it to work with OOR's grants and our grant or potentially even the fiscal incentive grant, I recommend that people reach out to me. Um, and then, so once that May 1st date comes about, from there, submitted proposals are reviewed and recommended by our OHV Advisory Council and our Utah Recreational Trails Advisory Council. So the motorized side review is reviewed by the OHV Advisory Council. The non-motorized side is reviewed by the Recreational Trails Advisory Council. From there, those recommendations receive a final recommendation at the combined Advisory Council meeting. It generally takes place in June or July. And then from there, the finalized list of projects are submitted to the UDOT Transportation Commission for administrative approval and funding. Contracts begin September 1st. No project work can begin before contract is in place. So please keep that in mind when you are applying for this. Um, also, it does have a two-year timeline for grants. So for every project that you have, it'll have a two-year timeline. If something comes up in the future and you need a modification or you need an extension, I recommend that you reach out to us prior to the expiration of that contract because there is there are a few more hoops that we have to jump through. It does go through UDOT. Again, we are just a pass-through agency. So please keep that in mind when you are applying or if you have a grant in place now and you need modifications to it, um, reach out to us early, please. And I think that may be my last slide. Again, I think that there is a question for me, but I will answer it in the chat. Also, it'll be later on that we'll uh, open it for more questions. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and everybody go ahead to take a look at, at Rachel's contact information. She's very helpful. Um, so, before we introduce our next speaker, um, just wanna encourage you, uh, utilize that chat box for any questions. Uh, Tara, Rachel, and myself are monitoring it. We'll happily answer anything. Um, and then once we're done with our presentations, um, if you do have any burning questions, um, I definitely wanna give you an opportunity for that. Um, so with that said, I would like to introduce Betsy Byrne. Um, and Betsy, I'm gonna go ahead and let you do your own intro while I prep your slides. That sounds good. Thanks, Patrick. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Betsy Byrne. I'm with the National Park Service uh, Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program. And, and looking at the participant list, I can see a lot of uh, familiar names. So I think there are a lot of um, friends out there in the, the audience. So hello, folks. But if you don't know um, what our um, pro um, program is, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview um, and talk a little bit about our uh, grant assistance in our application timeline. So let's see. I couldn't get it in the presentation mode. Sorry. And we're always really um, thrilled to be a part of these grant workshops. I think there's a really great connection between um, the assistance that we can provide and the, the, the grants that the Office of After Recreation provides and, and um, RTP as well. And so, um, and I think a couple of our projects have been mentioned. So you can kind of see that there's a, a sort of a progression from um, what we can help with, and then sort of what help helps going on down the line to, to get it implemented. So um, yeah, Patrick, if you'll just skip to the next slide, that'll be great. Um, so my program, I'm going to call it RTCA, but it stands for Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance. 
Um, and, and what we are is we help um, carry out the National Park Service's mission by supporting community-led outdoor recreation and conservation projects. And, and what that is, is the community coming to us with an idea, maybe for a trail or a, a, you know, an open space along a river or a park. Um, and we just help them kind of um, with a lot of those like early planning steps, getting their ducks in a row, figuring out what they want to do. Um, our grant is not a funding grant, it is a technical assistance grant. So what you get is um, some time of a National Park Service planner, or in my case, a landscape architect to help you um, to work on your project. Um, but we can help identify funding sources like the Office of Outdoor Recreation. And our projects really um, run the gamut. There's all, um, really depends on your needs, but they kind of fall within these um, um, five broad care, um, categories. Um, the most common being sort of that first um, building healthy communities through parks, trails. Um, this is developing or improving outdoor recreation access to lands or waters. Um, helping with, uh, right now I'm helping with uh, Grand County with a boat ramp project on the Colorado River just north of Lions Park. Um, my coworker Brandon is, is working on um, some trails projects. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that we really commonly work on. We also work on conservation projects uh, that can involve large landscape conservation, river restoration, or resiliency projects. Um, we work on projects that engage youth and outdoor rec recreation and stewardship. Um, one example there, a couple of years ago, I worked with Backman Elementary here in Salt Lake City, and we got the students involved in developing a concept plan for some open space along the Jordan River. Um, and one of the ideas that went into that concept plan was to have an outdoor classroom Last year, Bagman was able to apply to the outdoor classroom grant and got it. And so they're working on that right now. So um, that's kind of, that was kind of a fun example to see move forward. Um, we also work with, you know, um, strengthening organizational capacity that can be like developing trail committees, coalitions, um, groups that can, um, you know, carry forward the impl implementation and maintenance of a project long-term. Um, and, and finally, while the project doesn't have to have anything to do with a National Park Service unit, um, we know that gateway communities do have, you know, sort of unique challenges and opportunities, and, and we can work with communities to, um, you know, connect with their park unit um, and come up with shared goals and, and ideas um, that they can work on together. And, and that actually can extend to, to our other federal um, public land managers or state public land managers. Like I actually see quite a few of you in the, in the participant book participant box, but that could be, you know, can the community work with the local Bureau of Land Management field office to um, do some planning around recreation and we can help facilitate those connections and, and help people plan together. Uh, next, Patrick. So the, the kind of tasks that we help with, again, really vary on um, depending on the project, but a lot of that, you know, getting organized around an idea and helping develop the, the project. Um, we help you develop, you know, sort of, um, you know, figure out your vision and goals. Uh, we do really emphasize reaching out to your community, uh, getting the public involved, whether to build support for your project or, or get feedback on it. Um, you know, just helping things with like meeting facilitation, um, uh, building trust around your idea, um, capturing your ideas in like a concept plan. We, we don't um, do things to the level of construction documents or engineering documents, but we can kind of help develop a, a concept plan that illustrates um, ideas that the, the group has come up with. Um, so you can say, hey, we're, we're ready to go. We, we've thought of this through. We can um, pursue the next step. Um, and, and just helping, you know, some of those other organizational capacity things that I kind of mentioned, like developing coalitions that can identify the resources that they need um, long-term, whether to implement the project or maintain it um, and things like that. Um, Patrick, why don't you hit next? So Rachel actually talked about this just a second ago. This is a project of uh, my coworker, Brandon Stocksdale. He worked with the town of Gunnison on their G Hill and developed an area plan for that. And so that, what, what that is, if you're familiar, they have a big G, on the hill just right outside of town. And it's just really important to the community, a really important place um, for their community identity and a place for recreation and gathering. And so some of the things they worked on together were um, uh, formalizing a trails committee, um, identifying some trails facilities, priorities for that area. And then moving forward, one of their big wins was getting the money to purchase that um, parcel around the G from SITLA, and then also kind of develop a 
um, an agreement for a lease for the area around that with the idea that in the future they'll be able to to buy that uh, more land around there so they can extend their trail system. Um, and they also last year went um, applied for the UOR grant and and got it to to pursue some of that trail building. So they're they're really moving forward. Um, uh oh, there. Okay, there we go. <laughs> got some slides that are a little funky. Wow, I don't know what that is doing. Okay. Um, you know, Patrick, I've got it here. If you want me to. I've never seen that before. Yeah, that's a little thing. Let me just get organized here and. Um, I'm gonna okay. Let me see if. Oh, you've got it. We could do it like that. There we go. Perfect. Let's just hope they don't stack again. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> that looks great. Thanks. Um, so this is a project I worked on a few years ago. This is Cache County Trails and Active Transportation Plan. Um, and what we did there was we looked at sort of some existing ideas for trails and um, um, bike routes um, through the communities in Cache County, um, looked at gaps in the network, looked at ideas for, for new trails, um, things that we were getting from public feedback, um, what people wanted to see in Cache Valley, like an extension of the Bonneville Shoreline Trail, um, or, you know, connections east and west across Cache Valley to, to connect those communities. And um, so what I kind of helped with there was that public outreach to get that feedback, um, prioritizing some of the projects that we were hearing from folks and, and uh, developing the plan. And um, this, this number is a little bit old, but um, since this uh, plan was adopted, about 2.1 million in um, funds have been um, awarded for different projects that came out of this plan, um, like the Blacksmith Fork Connector Trail that, that Patrick actually mentioned earlier, or um, you know, they've gone on to do other um, things like the, the Cache uh, Bikeway Study, where you know, they looked at the spine of the active transportation network, which was a, a project that we um, identified as a priority in this in this process. So those are just a couple examples. Um, and, and I know that there are some folks that actually we've worked on, on here, like Lenny Peterson down in Helper. So <laughs> we have um, folks from all over the state that we've helped. Um, so this is just a couple of tips for a competitive application for us. Um, our application cycle, we have one yearly. This is a great time for us because um, we're um, kind of opening up the call for that now. And I'll put up a timeline in, a, in just a second. Um, and, and our assistance is, is open to communities, nonprofits, um, state partners, tribes, um, even federal partners, although we like to see federal partners partner with their local community or, or a nonprofit. Um, and what we like to see in an application are some clearly defined roles for, um, you know, for both for us and for the, the project partner. Um, you know, this is a community led project. So we are not the lead. We, we look to the community to be a lead. So we really like to see a strong local champion or leader who will work with us to, to drive that forward. We, we sometimes say we'll match the energy that you put into it. Um, we like to see clear project objectives um, and, and maybe part of what you need help with is kind of refining your vision and goals. And so we can talk about that, but we do like to see some kind of clear objective for what you want to get done. Um, and we like to see up to um, at least three letters of support or commitment from partners that, that outline their, um, what they might be bringing to the project. And that might be like, hey, we've got someone who's really good at GIS or um, someone who can help with public outreach. Or maybe that's your local land manager who says, yes, I, I really want to work with the community on this. So I will be attending all the meetings and, and we'll be partnering on this. So we do like to see that. And, you know, just um, give us a call um, or meet with us. We really like to meet with folks as they start thinking about their application and put it together so we can help you refine um, roles, objectives, things like that, help you think through some of the partners that you might want to get a letter of support from um, and, and stuff like that. So. This is our timeline. You can see our website there at the top. That's nps.gov slash RTCA. You can find our application on there. Um, like I said, right now, we're kind of opening up a call for, for applications and we want to meet with folks over the next couple of months if they have an idea. We've met with um, a few already who, who are, are thinking of some ideas. And then those applications are due March 1st. And um, we have a kind of a selection process that we do with our, we have a regional team. So there will be people from other states reviewing applications with us. Um, and we do that sort of April, May. And then um, 
announce the project selection. And usually after that, we can kick off the project. Um, again, please reach out. We'd love to talk more about any ideas you, you might have. Um, my um, email address is on there as well as Brandon Stocksdale, my, my coworker. Um, and um, we, we just love to hear from you. Um, we, we love to work with communities. So thanks again to Patrick and Tara for, for letting me jump on this call today. We, we love having